Good afternoon, everyone. To our SVR attendees and to our viewers following us from YouTube, from Brazil and from all around the world, we welcome you to SVR 2021. We have prepared a very special program for this week, and we are very proud to introduce you to our first keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Dita Schmaustig. Professor Schmaustig is full professor and head of the Institute of Computer and Graphics and Vision at Graz University of Technology in Austria. Um, he's author of the book, Augmented Reality, Principles and Practice. And in 2020, he received the IEEE's Mar Career Impact Award. Today, he's going to talk to us about situated analytics in augmented reality. And if you are attending SVR, please make sure to add your questions in our Discord channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, Feel free to add your questions in the chat uh, so Professor Schmausi can answer them after his talk. So, without further ado, I will pass the word to Professor Schmausi. Hello, everybody. Hello, Victor. Thank you for the kind introduction. It is my pleasure to be virtually there. Unfortunately, I've never really been, been there. Uh, but maybe that will be in the future. So let me uh, try and uh, I think you should be seeing my screen now. Victor, is that working all right with my slides? It's open. Are the slides okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so let's get started. I would like to talk about situated analytics in augmented reality today. And uh, obviously, um, to this audience, I do not really have to uh, introduce why augmented reality is interesting to me. Um, so what we're trying to do in augmented reality as opposed to virtual reality is that we bring in the real world. We overlay the real world with computer graphics, and this has received quite a boost recently through the availability of uh, virtual reality glasses such as the Microsoft HoloLens for example um, which are you know quite quite sophisticated devices already uh, that uh, do the tracking they do graphics they are mobile uh, they work anywhere indoors and outdoors and obviously as this uh, video clip suggests you can get this sort of natural user interface that is integrated into the physical environment. So for example, if you're a maintenance person and you have to repair a machine, then it can be very, very important that you get this information about the machine in real time and in the place where the information belongs. This is of course a fake machine. It's made from some plastic parts that we, <laughs> we bought at the, uh, the local uh, warehouse um, but we actually the reason is I cannot show the, the this is an industrial collaboration and I cannot show the real machine here but you see that there's a quite a compelling uh, visual result uh, giving explanations to people so uh, what are we doing here well what we're doing is we are presenting a form of visualization and uh, now that prompts the second question what makes visualization interesting and visualization is not the same as computer graphics, as I'm sure you're all aware of. Visualization is visualization is using computer graphics, usually on a desktop computer, of course, to make data visible and thereby providing insight. So rather than looking at long um, columns of numbers, it is much more uh, convenient and understandable to see a visual representation of that data. And this is particularly important for this group of people uh, that we can loosely call information workers. So people who work with digital data now and uh, who need some support for their own cognition. Um, so what, what this means, this, this, this insight is maybe very well illustrated on this right-hand side here. This is a historical visualization, which of course was drawn on paper in 1869, showing the, uh, the progress of Napoleon's uh, 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 trip with, uh, with the French army to, to Russia, that is uh, from west to east, and then 
retreated Moscow and all the way back. And the width of the lines here shows the, the strength of his troops at any given point in time. Um, so that gives us a good idea of what was going on historically there. Yeah? And so uh, what visualization is doing here is taking abstract data and giving it meaning and making it understandable. So unlike, let's say, virtual reality, which is a lot about presence, the feeling of being there in the virtual space, here we are more interested in supporting human cognition. That is, we want humans to perceive, we want humans to understand, we want you humans to make decisions and get given aid in, in these decisions. Huh? And uh, that is a very abstract goal, but then, of course, spatial understanding is an important part of this cognition. It aids the cognition. We are spatial animals, and we like to look at diagrams like this here, where uh, the, you know, the general trajectory is like on a map, but then the width of the line encodes something else. Yeah? So you have both. You have the spatial understanding and you have the abstract data. And this need for spatial understanding is what brings us back to virtual reality and augmented reality. And I think this connection was always there, but up until recently, virtual reality, augmented reality maybe wasn't powerful enough uh, to really uh, be a platform for visualization. And uh, when I say that, of course, people have tried already a long time ago, even before I started my career, to do this thing called immersive visualization, where immersion is basically in this context here means using virtual reality for visualization. So for example, Steve Bryson at NASA in already in 1992 built the virtual wind tunnel, which was this virtual counterpart of a physical wind tunnel where are usually uh, uh, you know, vehicles and aircraft and space shuttle and so on are tested for their aerodynamic properties. So the idea is to go into the exploration of flow data and this flow data comes from simulations. It doesn't exist in reality. There's a, there's a model, geometric model of an aircraft and then there's a, a simulation of flow data and this uh, simulation in the form of these streamlines. So these are these colorful lines here that show the flow was presented on a 3D stereoscopic display at the time. This is this sort of a binocular kind of thing called a boom that was suspended with a mechanical tracker. Remember, this is 30 years ago. Yeah, it was very, a very compelling system at the time. But it never became mainstream because there wasn't really uh, the, the, the right kind of virtual reality, augmented reality hardware. Um, 1992, NASA had to build their own 3D display and develop their own scientific visualization application, whereas in uh, 2021, now you can buy an Oculus Quest 2 headset. I'm just saying this because I believe it gives a lot of, of value for the, for the price uh, and run the Unity game engine on that. And you can write your own code without uh, any spending anything on the software and a few hundred uh, dollars or euro on the hardware. Yeah? So it's very easy now to get started in immersive visualization. And of course, that makes a big difference in the kind of interest that we can receive here. Uh, if you look at um, the number of papers that are published on immersive visualization and immersive analytics, uh, you see it's clearly peaking now. There's actually 20, 2016, there's the sudden rise. This is when the first version of the Oculus Rift was released. Huh? So we see a lot of interest in uh, visualization uh, in immersive visualization, in immersive analytics. Um, and uh, this combination of virtual reality and visualization is very powerful as a new tool for data analysis. And I'm showing you here a picture of the immersive axis work of uh, uh, Maxime Cordell and his colleagues. Uh, so this is a really compelling immersive visualization system. You see how the data can be you know, it instantly shows different kinds of views depending on how these uh, 3D axes are arranged in 3D space. And so you can build a large variety of uh, visual analytics views in a fraction of the time. And what, what that is doing, if we, if we think about it, is what we, we get a spatially registered visualization. Yeah? So in this three-dimensional space, left is left, right is right, it's not abstract, it's a, it's a concrete thing in this virtual world. You can reach out and touch, touch the data. You can 
sort of work with your own body. You can spatially move about. There's the sense of proprioception that tells you where your body parts are. Yeah? So you can navigate in this space. You can use 3D direct interaction and it makes sense. But there's a very large but here. The meaning of the physical space is actually arbitrary, right? This is an abstract gray plane that goes to infinity. The visualization that is in there only relates to itself. There's no notion of the real world. You have to understand everything that is shown uh, in terms of uh, making sense of, uh, of the colorful pixels that you see here. Yeah? And uh, there is also the physical world. The physical world exists around us all the time, maybe except when we're wearing a virtual reality headset where we can't see the real world anymore. Refer and uh, this uh, physical world is full of reference. And by reference, I mean meaningful physical objects that are in the user's perceptual proximity. And uh, we, we often have visualizations that are somehow related to reference. And the, the term meaningful is important. It refers to the context in which we're operating or in which we're using a, a digital computer application. Yeah? So think about a wall on which something is presented, uh, overlaid with, with uh, augmented reality. Yeah? So a wall where you show a bar chart is not a reference because the bar chart has no relationship to the wall. Whereas if you're showing a visualization of the electrical wires that are inside the wall, uh, and you overlay them as an X-ray visualization in augmented reality, then the, the wall suddenly is a referent. Yeah? So it's important that the referent also makes sense. It's not only your spatial container where you put some data. Uh, and you see here examples from the real world on the right-hand side, which are, of course, uh, situated displays, such as uh, a speed limit sign that relates to your car speed. Or um, when you go to the bus stop, um, then an app might detect your place and give you some information on the right uh, bus route or the timetable. Yeah? Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of context that comes from the reference, and this is how we would like to consume this data and interact with the data. And of course, the reference affords physical interaction. You can move around furniture in your uh, apartment to, to do some... some uh, improvement or you can open something to reveal what is inside. Yeah, the reference establish physical context around us. So this is what reference share with this other area called ubiquitous computing. But now when we go to augmented reality, we want it to be much more fine grained. We don't only want to know that we are at a bus stop. We want to know exactly um, if there are two buses, then I want to be able to discriminate one bus from the other and get the right uh, schedule information. Uh, and that brings us to situated visualization. So situated visualization is really a visualization that is both spatially registered, as we had in the virtual reality case, but also related to a referent. Uh, and this is best uh, implemented by combining augmented reality with visualization, and that's what I then call situated visualization. Um, so I didn't invent the term, that was Sean White a couple of, of years ago. And there's, there's a good argument why situated visualization has to happen in augmented reality. So first of all, the reference must be visible or somehow perceivable. That basically rules out virtual reality where you can't see the real world. And second, the visualization must be spatially registered so you can't just have a 2D map or some general view. Right? It has to be some three-dimensional uh, embedding of the visualization in the environment. And this is why augmented reality and visualization together bring this new capability, because augmented reality gives us the tools to implement situated visualization. And now you might ask, why do we care at all? Right? This is. Uh, uh, we, we already have immersive visualization. Why would we now want situated visualization or situated analytics? Well, um, we all observe this strong trend that people want more and more artificial intelligence. But what I'm saying is that in most cases, people don't want artificial intelligence that takes away the decision making from the human. What we want is the opposite. We want intelligence amplification, IA, not AI. And again, I didn't invent this notion. 
this already goes back to the 1950s. Uh, 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 Ashby wrote the book on introduction to cybernetics when the first uh, sort of uh, uh, complex uh, electronic systems were being designed and proposed that what we really want is we want to make the human more intelligent or give an, an, an enhanced human's intelligence capabilities. And I would argue that intelligence amplification is already a killer application for mobile phone. We have Wikipedia on our phones or Google search or maps or QR codes and so on, right? All of this is making us appear more intelligent. When you enter a conversation now, and you can't remember when Napoleon died, um, then you look it up on Wikipedia very quickly. You know, it's not even embarrassing anymore. When I was a kid, you had to learn that by heart. Of course, I've forgotten most of those things. So I'm apparently more intelligent now just by having a mobile phone. And in the same in the, in the same line of argument, augmented uh, uh, augmented reality. Uh, has intelligence amplification as a killer app. I don't think it's, well, I mean, Pokemon Go is a great game, right? But I think IA is going to be much more important. I, augmented reality can be a natural user interface where you interact with reference in the environment via augmented reality. So you get away from this sort of text oriented symbolic user interface that we currently have in all the apps, yeah, scrolling and reading text and so on is kind of not quite as intuitive as just pointing to a referent. So when we uh, all have these augmented reality capabilities, and technically that can be very soon, uh, then we have a, a new medium that will make us appear or maybe actually be very smart. And uh, as a side effect, if this is going to happen on augmented reality glasses, then you don't even have to take out your phone anymore and you know scroll through the app list until you finally find what you're looking for. And if you're actually looking into the environment, you may see other people and you may not run into the next street lamp uh, because you are uh, occupied with your phone. So there's very, very uh, nice side effects of that. And uh, this is why I think situated visualization will be a, will be a very important um, form of uh, intelligence amplification. And I would like to point out with, a, with an example what is going on here, what kind of technical steps are necessary to deliver a situated visualization. And, uh, you know, in, in these days, when we have a, a, a computer based application, it's all about digitalization. So we always start with the real world and then some aspect of the real world is digitized. This is what I call modeling here. And then you can take that data, be it ge geometric or appearance-based or abstract, and it can go into a visualization process. And then we show something, conventionally we show it on a screen or maybe on a mobile phone or something like that. Huh? Um, but the new aspect that situated visualization brings is that it actually closes the cycle. So when you upgrade a visualization to a situated visualization, you're actually place, placing it back in the user's perception of the real world. And therefore you suddenly uh, close the cycle and you have uh, established this connection where you're back in the real world and you're no, no longer disconnected from it. And I want to give you a, a short example of an application that we have been recently uh, working on that I think is a nice showcase for uh, bringing situated visualization. Uh, and this is virtual spray paint simulation. You all know that when there's construction going on on the street, uh, it's common that the, somebody, the planner, applies some spray paint on the, on the concrete surface to mark where uh, digging should happen and where you shouldn't dig because there's a very power line, for example, that you cannot break with the with the excavation process. There's conventions in the construction industry, such as colors, uh, showing us what what kind of infrastructure is buried underneath, and uh, and this is an established way of of, of working in, in in construction and in particular when it comes to what is called subsurface utility engineering. So dealing with power lines and gas lines and things like that. Yeah? Uh, but then the spray painting is not so nice. It, 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 it sticks on the street. It, it, if, if, they, if the construction is complete, they should actually remove all the spray paint, but often they don't. 
Um, there's there's problems with that. It's not uh, it's not as versatile as it should be. And with the right kind of augmented reality system, and now I'm showing you an outdoor augmented reality system running on an uh, on an iPad with an additional uh, sensing unit for a high quality GPS. With that, we can actually do spray paint simulation where you first scan the, the, the 3D structure of the street and then we apply paint particles so they look like they're really physical spray paint, but it's all virtual and it has a much more compelling look than, uh, you know, uh, con more conventional overlays, also with very high precision. And I'll show you a little video clip to can localize accurate that. outdoors. We use our setup to localize in outdoor environments and to retrieve GIS data from subsurface infrastructure. Our new spray painted effect draws realistic spray markings directly on the street surface. The virtual markings can be hardly distinguished from real physical markings as the actual appearance of the scene is incorporated directly in the spray effect. The effect is very versatile and can be deployed in a lot of different colors, line styles, or levels of transparency. Because we draw on the surface reconstructed from LiDAR, the spray paint correctly follows curves or sinks, where a naive overlay rendering suffers from perspective offsets. GIS data attributes can be used to draw more informative information, like pipe width or pipe type on the surface as well. Using LiDAR scan. Okay, so that's the virtual spray paint. And the second um, part of this uh, system for construction workers or for subsurface utility engineering is providing X ray vision. So, what you see here is on the left hand side, you see a worker uh, or planner with, a, with an iPad again. You see the red fire hydrant. And what you see on the right hand side is an enlargement of the a view that is shown on the screen. You still see the socket of the fire hydrant, but then you see a 3D scan of a previous excavation that was produced when the ground was open the last time, uh, superimposed in real time at this location. So you know exactly what is underneath without actually having to dig it up first, provided that you have a previous scan. So suddenly these previous scans, which are routinely created in that industry, uh, get a much more, get a much higher value because you can now use them to orient yourself at a later time, um, actually in while you're at the location that uh, that you want to dig up. For scanners, dense point cloud reconstructions of real excavations can be created nowadays at site. Similar to drawing spray markings, we can visualize these reconstructions at site using our outdoor localization device. Our method places proper occluders around the reconstructions to give the viewer the real looking into a hole experience. Let's. So um, let, let's take an inventory of what is going on here. Here's again my closed cycle uh, corresponding to the value chain. Uh, what you see here is we start with the real world environment, for example, of the open excavation site. Also, uh, during runtime, you, there's a, you know, the 3D mapping of the SLAM system going on, which is just the standard uh, SLAM system running on, on the iPad with ARKit. Um, but then we, we put that into an application that generates the spray paint overlays and presents the virtual spray paint or the excavation in a situated visualization form. Yeah, so exactly these components make up a, a situated visualization uh, solution. And uh, important here is that we have these reference. So we have, uh, we had the street in this case, we have the buried infrastructure, such as the pipes and so on. These were our reference in that case. And if we look at the possibilities of all these reference, they can either be stationary or they can be moving. If you have moving reference, then of course you need to track them through space. So you need some dynamic models for that. You can have just a single object or you can have many, many different objects. If you want to show many different objects, then your application gets more complex, you have more clutter to deal with, uh, so you have to uh, possibly not show everything at once. 
There's the issue of visibility, as we have just seen with this uh, uh, excavation site and the subsurface utility engineering example. Um, there's uh, the, the, the issue here is that if you're interested in the buried pipes, you can't see them, but you can see the street level. So the street level is basically what you could call a visibility proxy for what lies underneath. And we often have these kind of occlusion situations. We can have active or passive reference. So a passive reference are just passive objects which have to be detected and tracked, um, in particular if they're mobile. But we can also have active objects, for example, Internet of Things devices, yeah, which give us sensor data in real time. Um, and finally, we can have even more active reference, which would be living reference, such as a human body, your own body, but also the body of other people for collaborative or social applications. And each of these aspects of reference gives rise to interesting research problems in, in situated visualizations. This is just opening up and all use the rest of the time to give you a few examples of, uh, of uh, what can be done with situated visualization and with reference. Um, so I'll start you off with just another x-ray example. Here you see instruction generation. When you have to do some maintenance, then it would really be good to know what you should be doing before you're doing it. And the way this is usually conveyed is with printed manuals where, for example, this door is open. But with this with uh, augmented reality and with the right kind of input data, which in this case is just computer-aided design data of the manufacturer, we can actually present uh, what is inside the machine as a preview, if you want. So here the referent is hidden inside the machine. Another uh, idea is that the referent can be your own body. Yeah? So your body becomes a canvas for information displays. What you see here is a user with a smartwatch um, so the whole thing is simulated actually, but it's it's filmed through a real optical see-through head-mounted display. And you see how suddenly the screen surface of your smartwatch, which you can see as the referent here, becomes much larger. And you have sort of clipboards all around on your forearm and so on, where you can put information. Um, and here, in this example, which is actually a pretty old video from 2003 already, uh, the referent is the second person. So this is a collaborative application for training mathematic and mathematics and geometry. Yeah? And uh, replacing pencil and paper basically with, uh, with augmented reality. And the important aspect of this system here is that there's multiple users. One is the teacher, the others maybe students um, who are looking at the explanations and both see the same time at the same time the same object in space which can be dynamically manipulated and so this is called shared space metaphor um, yeah so there's there's really a lot of uh, of uh, interesting directions to explore also from a from a sort of a cognitive uh, perspective what what humans do with this kind of interface and they all evolve around situated uh, visualization and they require also more basic technology. If, even if we only use very sort of casual forms of visualization where we, you know, we are not, we're not presenting some fancy interaction, we're just showing the data in a, in a nice, uh, nice visual representation and you basically just look at the data um, you will still require uh, methods that make sure that the visualization has good perceptual properties. So it has to be legible. Um, it has to have good contrast and so on. Um, labels have to be placed so that, so that there's no clutter. Uh, also, details should only be revealed on demand, you know, focused in context kind of visualizations that are somehow optimal for human perception, these issues have been studied a lot in the area of visualization, but all for the desktop or sometimes for very large screens, like, like wall size screens, but hardly for embedded in a real environment where you have this interaction with the physical world and with the reference. If you want to show a, a text on a red car, then better the font color shouldn't be red because then you can't read it. That's a kind of interaction that would never happen on a desktop computer. And in order to provide that, we also need what I like to call environmental uh, artificial intelligence. That means 
we have to have we have to understand what's happening or the system has to understand what's happening around us uh, provide some level of scene understanding um, in order to present the information in the right way and i'll just show you a few examples of what could happen there which are all in some sense they are variants of known problems but the embedding in a physical environment makes them unique so let's just look at label placement what you see here is a model of a human heart as you might find in any medical textbook yeah? and we've run a, a an, an algorithm for labeling that places the labels around the object such that uh, all the labels are close to the to the to the parts of the heart that they are labeling and no none of the labels overlaps yeah, so it's a standard method for producing nice uh, nice uh, legends you know drawings with with labels for printed material if we do if we put that in a in an augmented reality environment a free camera motion then this happens yeah? it's just terrible there's uh, the labels are swinging around swimming around they are not behaving nicely. Um, this is not how you want to look at that while you're moving your head around this model. Uh, you get sick from it. Uh, so uh, we have to do something better. We have to respect the fact that we want to, uh, we want the labels to uh, be stable under three-dimensional motion. And this is what it looks like. And what has happened here? We're treating the problem no longer as a 2D problem. We're now treating it as a 3D problem, but the, Result is still a 2D image. Yeah? So uh, in this case, it's uh, the labels overlaid on the video. But what you can think of this is uh, the labels are now no longer connected with lines drawn in screen space. They are connected with lines which stick out in 3D. And that lets us to ensure that there's a temporal coherence under 3D motion. Yeah? So it's a different kind of problem because we've moved to a new medium, the medium uh, being augmented reality. Um, so uh, let me move on then uh, how much time do I still have okay um, so uh, here's another example um, details on demand you cannot show all the information at once so for example if you have uh, an augmented reality view here of a city and you have a lot of information that you want to present. This is housing prices that are being visualized here with these little glyphs. Yeah? If you show them for all the houses, then you just have a big uh, mess. And so what the user should be able is to uh, dynamically drill down on information that is relevant. So here the user actually has a pointer, um, make some selection. And now the user can uh, select something and get more information in certain areas and other information is then automatically collapsed to an overview. Yeah? And uh, this happens all around the user in the, in the three-dimensional display. Yeah? Um, so actually it's, a, it's an, an, a live optimization process that is trying to show the information that is most relevant for the user. Here. Um, Here's, uh, here's another example of, uh, of a focus and context method. So in this case, we have a user uh, who gets an information feed from a drone with a camera. The thing that you see here on the, on the ground floor is actually the camera. And the camera is sending a live video stream, as you can see here in this split uh, view and is showing a live image but the live image is not presented from a first person perspective it's actually presented from a third person perspective where you see what the drone is seeing embedded in a three-dimensional model of the environment so the, the the net effect is that the user who is standing in front of a wall as you can see here has the impression of being able to look through the wall and see what the drone is seeing of course it's limited to the current field of view of the drone, but then the user can steer the drone with some gestures like go here, go there, uh, and explore this hidden environment. Uh, so what this really is, if we, if we express it in terms of visualization, is a focus and context visualization, where the focus is the camera stream from the drone, but then the context is the three-dimensional model of the hidden environment. And now I would like to switch gears a little bit and talk about um situated and embodied analytics yeah so when the 
when it's no longer sufficient to just look at the data in their sort of standard presentation, uh, but you need to interact with the data and sort of drill deeper to understand the meaning, uh, then we call this in conventional uh, desktop computing or in, con in conventional uh, visualization notion, we call that visual analytics. Yeah? So the science of analytical reasoning through interactive visual interfaces. The same, of course, also applies to AR and there we can call it situated analytics or maybe even embodied analytics. Yeah? Uh, so we want to study complex data close to a referent. And a good example of that would be diagnosing a faulty machine in a factory. That can be a very elaborate task that requires both being physically present and um, making sense of complex data at the same time. And the classic way of doing that is you bring a laptop to a task location, then you always switch between repairing the machine and looking something up on the laptop. Yeah? So we want to do better we want to present complex information in a situated manner. And now we have suddenly a different problem. We don't only have the problem of uh, if we have all the data that we want to present and we can use these tools that I've just shown you. Um, but if we don't have the data, then we have an authoring problem. Where does the smart content come from? Huh? And there's a huge semantic gap between what exists in the digital reality and what, what, what exists in, in physical reality. And we have to get this data uh, into our augmented reality application to provide the user with embodied analytics capabilities. And uh, I'll just show you one or two examples of how this uh, could be done. So uh, my first is getting the data out of legacy data such as printed manuals. Yeah, and this can actually be done by scanning in the manuals, comparing them to a computer-aided design model of a particular machine in this case, and then making comparisons where you have heuristics such as, for example, if you see an error, this usually means that you have to pull out the part. And now all you have to do is you have to find the part that is next to the shaft of the arrow, and this is the part that is going to be removed if it's possible to remove it at this time. Now, this uh, uh, this assembly or assembly analysis is, of course, a, a complex three-dimensional problem in its own right that requires some algorithms to uh, actually find out whether you can remove this part or which part you can remove. Um, but we're not necessarily limited to rigid objects such as this coffee machine that you saw in the last uh, example. We can also do it with uh, deformable objects such as the human face. So in another project, we investigated what happens if you're working with some tools on some surfaces. And a good example here is applying makeup. YouTube is full of makeup tutorials, usually for ladies, not for my male graduate students. But this graduate student wants to apply a uh, cat uh, makeup uh, whiskers and uh, we can actually analyze a video where this is painted on another face and transfer it to here and other um, sort of surface tool operations such as soldering or painting with watercolors and so on can be uh, augmented in that way as well. And uh, if you have more complicated assembly structures, but you do not have the printed manuals that I've shown you beforehand, then uh, what could also be done is you just watch somebody doing the job for you. This is what you see on the top here. So here an object is uh, being, uh, uh, is being mm -hmm. disassembled. Yeah, the assembly and disassembly is always the same because just the order of operations changes. And we can use this video to, to figure out what the order of the parts is that are assembled or disassembled. And then later we can give guidance, for example, in the form of this virtual mirror here. So here the augmented reality system is actually a conventional display which shows everything in a mirrored way. And now the user gets the instruction which part to attach next and where to attach it. And we also have these little video clips that play automatically that show you how to do it. So which tool you should be using, which of course come from directly from the observation in the, in the video. So what I would call this is authoring by examples. Rather than using existing legacy data, here we're using examples in the form of videos to, to define the problem. And uh, 
if we do not have a model, we can also make it work. Yeah? So what you see here is that we're creating a model on the fly, but we're not creating a geometric model, we're capturing a light field. This is why this uh, green sphere here is progressively becoming transparent as you're capturing enough images from all sides. You get an approximate 3D model with very high visual fidelity, but no geometry at all. It's only images. Yeah? And this, this collection of images can then be streamed to another uh, system, in this case, also a smartphone, where this user who is supposed to be a remote expert gives some instruction by painting this little arrow. Yeah? And the arrow is now not only a scribble on top of a 2D video, the arrow can be upgraded to a three-dimensional instruction by reasoning about where the surface is, where this arrow is touching. And I'll show you the result in the next slide here. So now this annotated light field is sent back to the user. And you see there's a three-dimensional error here, which was just drawn on the touch screen of a mobile phone uh, by uh, integrating the error with the light field. So a very easy way of creating these uh, instructions that overcome. It's, it's as easy as doing stuff in 2D, but we get three-dimensional effect with a very, very nice quality. And it also works for uh, these difficult objects where normally 3D scanning fails, such as shiny metal parts or glass or acryl or transparent materials. Yeah, and uh, my final example uh, is actually an Internet of Things scenario. Yeah, I've, uh, I've mentioned already that the, we are not only interested in passive reference, but also interested in active reference. So consider a basement where you have a heating system, water pump, and so on. Now we have smart sensors and smart meters everywhere. This is uh, up and coming. Um, but normally you have to go to an office, call up maybe some web interface and read the sensor data there. And then you're not in the basement. Huh? So um, what we would like to do is we would like to automatically connect to those sensors while we are doing some maintenance procedure. For, let's say you're the, uh, the, the, the building maintenance person um, and you have to go and check why the heating is malfunctioning. Then you would like to be able to read all the heating related data while you're in the basement. Huh? And uh, we want to do that in a convenient way. Uh, such that visualizations are automatically generated for those sensors that you, you're looking at and without pre-configuring everything. And this is the most important detail here. Yeah? This is in the, the Internet of Things scenario when you have a big database of everything that was um, um, installed in the basement is all fine. But if you have smart sensors, they can register in your visualization in real time and then you can do things as such as providing more details as you get closer. And I'll show you that this can actually work. So it's not very fancy visualization here, um, but I think uh, you will be compelled by the things that go on here. Sorry, now the video is uh, not playing. Let me try restarting this. Ah, there we go. So I'll jump ahead a little bit. So this is this is filmed off an iPad again. Yeah, we see here a list of sensor devices pops up. They're just called Temp One, Temp Two, and Temp Four are visible right now. So it's not very very creative naming, but you see that. Um, there is, okay, this jumps a little bit now because the tracking was slightly off, but you see that you get the, the, the sensor details overlaid on top of the sensor. And then with a little bit of interaction, you get some graphs and additional information in a, that, that is related to what you're currently looking at. Yeah? And uh, very precisely, centimeter level accuracy can also be manipulated and customized. And now we're going to look at the ceiling next, where you're seeing uh, the sensors on the ceiling. And again, the right kind of information pops up and can be retrieved by the user for closer inspection. Huh? 
Um, so this is the and on the in the inset on the upper right hand side you actually see the user moving through the basement performing the work. Uh, so this is really an an actually an automated environment that. Uh, um, connects to the sensors that are in the vicinity that are actually on the same Wi-Fi subnet. This is what is what is going on here in real time to delete, to retrieve the data, interpret the data, and then show the data uh, as visualization overlays. And uh, if we get accustomed to this form of information consumption, then probably I'm speculating nobody would want to go back to these you know, apps, you have tens of apps on your smartphone that just basically just show you text. Yeah? Now, um, it's, this is, this, oh, this problem space is actually also um, a deep one from a, from a sort of human perspective. Yeah, we can ask ourselves, when does embodiment lead to greater effectiveness? When does situatedness lead to greater effectiveness? Do people really prefer it? Yeah? How much embodiment is needed or justified? Is uh, cognitive load reduced by this form of visualization? Uh, how can we actually use the space around us to the best advantage? How can we design 3D, in, well, any kind of interaction technique, selection, manipulation, and so on, that works in the physical environment? And what techniques can we use to navigate all that data? Uh, these are many, many open questions that will still have to be addressed that require probably new design approaches for, um, for this new medium. And, uh, and uh, I guess this brings me to the end today. I have many more things to discuss, but uh, time is short. So I hope you found this uh, somewhat interesting. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. So thank you, Dita, for this great talk. It was very good. Uh, we have already some questions here on Discord, um, and I will read them to you. So the first one comes from Georgi. He's asking, uh, in your research, how do you balance developing design guidelines for situated analytics applications um, in the long term when better AR and tracking technology is available? versus creating applications for usage in the near term with the current limitations. Uh, he asked if you agree that it's sometimes better to use current VR displays and interactions to simulate AR environments in situated analytics research. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, these are good points. I, I, I agree. I, I believe in a, a reasonable amount of ecological validity. So in my research, I prefer to build a real prototype that actually works in AR and maybe choose the, the scenario such that the disadvantages that AR still has or the technical limitations don't hurt us too much. Yeah? And then I get some insight into how people really react to that. It's even better if you can work with, with actual domain experts um, who, like for example, real construction workers in the construction example. If you can convince them, then you've basically won. Yeah? But that is sometimes very hard. There are technical limitations of AR, as was noted. Uh, also, they may be just conservative and they tell you, yeah, this is, this is nice, but it's not saving me enough time to invest in that kind of equipment. This is the kind of answer you get. Yeah? So, it's already good, but it has to be even better before they would even consider it. Um, and uh, the other idea is you do something in the lab in relatively constrained circumstances, or even go to, at the very extreme, go to simulating AR and VR, so you, you can be sure you have absolute control over everything. Yeah? Um, that is good if you want to establish some very, some first principles, yeah? the test for, human performance, not so much human, you know, when you want to go quantitative, then you would choose this. And I believe both will be necessary. I mean, I'm personally am more on the qualitative side, um, as I think I've just said, but the other thing is also necessary. So we understand what we can expect. Yeah? It, it won't be better than in this lab. The, the, the results cannot be better than in the lab <laughs> result where you're controlling everything. Um, 
so it's a baseline that has to be established, probably has to be established first, and then you can go out in the wild and see how close you can get to the baseline. Um, and uh, the, the, the order in which these things happen is, is, is actually difficult to decide because it, this is always an, 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 a cycle of inspiration, right? You try out something, you learn something, and then you have to either find out whether, it, whether it's a first principle, so it's sort of a, a hard fact, that hard finding, um, or you may do the opposite. You start with some theoretical experiment, and then you have to figure out whether it actually holds up in practice. Yeah? Those is, I think, necessary, and, and one can't, uh, well, you get only half the picture if you only try one of those. Um, I also have one question. You mentioned the um, uh, resistance for the target user sometimes to adopt the technology. That uh, seems nice, but maybe not. Um, do you notice a common uh, uh, um, argument for not adopting? Is, is it usually related to the technical limitations or there are any other factors related to this resistance in, on accepting or uh, adopting? Such technologies. Well, I mean, ergonomics. A technical one technical limitation is is ergonomic, an ergonomic limitation, right? So, for example, take the Hololens, which is a really sophisticated uh, device, but nobody wants to wear it all day long, um, and uh, you couldn't even because the battery runs out. I mean, the way we are forcing the device to give its best battery is dead in two hours, right? So two hours lifetime is not something we accept of our uh, smartphones these days. And uh, if you want to convince people to use a, some sort of AR headset, then you would also have to give them, I don't know, more battery life. Yeah? So that, that, is, that will actually be quite challenging uh, in, the, in the short term and in the midterm. Um, there are now, I don't know if you've looked at the, the Spectacles version 4 that Snap has brought out. That's another set of AR glasses, which has uh, other disadvantages and an even shorter battery life, but it looks like a pair of sunglasses that you could actually wear on the street without being looked at. Yeah, you, the people will think you're a, a, a very trendy person, yeah? but you can't run on the street with the HoloLens. People would think you are crazy or something. Yeah? So, you know, this is this is this is one part of the reservations that people have. It has to become more more of a commodity uh, before we will see some success there. And then, of course, there is this whole problem of an ecosystem. Right now, you know, some things become so cheap that you're using it all the time. The, the mobile networks were built for voice, but now we use them primarily for data. And it's an, an outgrowth of the voice service that we originally had. And, uh, and it has completely uh, swapped over from voice to data. And uh, so I think at some point, if it just gets cheap enough, fast enough, longest enough, battery life, enough uh, content that is designed for augmented reality consumption, then we might see this new medium replacing an old medium. Yeah? I think, uh, I don't know a, 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 about you, but uh, in my family, people, we, you know, we have Netflix and various streaming services. We have regular satellite TV. Um, streaming services are 90% of what is being watched in my family throughout all family members. Right? It, has, it has, and I can't tell you when that happened. I can give you a, window of two years or so yeah? but at some point really the if i switched off normal tv now in in my household nothing bad would happen yeah? nobody well i mean <laughs> there would barely be any complaints and at this point is not quite there for a medium such as augmented reality but if you look at the potential you know in a very this is a very un unscientific argument that I'm bringing now. You look at these things, you can feel how important it could be. And I mean, the boss of Apple, Tim Cook says it's the next big thing. Yeah? So the question is only when that uh, switch over will happen. And then I'm speculating that this kind of information 
you know, context aware, referent aware information display, in particular in the form of in, in visual form, will be an, an, a very, very important part of it. I haven't spoken about other things such as entertainment and games and so on, which I believe will also fill large uh, needs that people have, where we've already seen some of that. But I think this intelligence amplification by visual information access, this is, is going to be a very, very uh, compelling uh, uh, scenario that eventually will succeed and I cannot control the, the, the rate at which uh, hardware development progresses. But uh, I believe it's, I think we can now see that it's entirely possible if enough more, and you know, we're talking about billion dollar investments here. Um, and, uh, and these are being made, you know, Oculus got 2 billion. We know that the HoloLens one cost half a billion, Google Glass cost half a billion in development. These, these investments are being made and uh, they are made for a good reason. So I think that we will see this trajectory continuing, but you have to be a little patient and uh, somebody will be, will be there in the right spot. To, everybody in the, in the large technology companies, of course, they are uh, waiting they want to own this market this new market this is why they make these investments and if you come too early then your investment is wasted and if you come too late then you don't get your market share so this is a big big problem for everybody um, but it doesn't change the direction in which things are moving and meanwhile we do research right uh, we have another question here um luciana says uh, thanks for the inspiring talk uh, in your work, how are you dealing with the hardware limitations, namely the small field of view, the difficulty of tracking moving real objects, and so on? Yeah, um, I mean, th th these are different hardware limitations. Yeah? So uh, the, the, the small field of view, for example, you have to design the, the examples on which you're showcasing things such that um, it, it makes sense and is not too difficult. Yeah? So, uh, so there, there, there are actually things that wouldn't work very nicely, but of course, I'm not showing you the counter examples. <laughs> We're still trying to find better solutions. Um, there is actually the, um, the, the new headsets do video see-through with a much wider field of view. That's, that's actually an alternative. Then when it comes to tracking quality, I think the slam tracking, so the self-tracking of the headsets and, and, the, and the also you know, iPad and so on. This works pretty good now. The problem is more detecting and tracking other objects, which may not always be in the field of view. And that is indeed a problem. So for the experiments, we can of course instrument the environment sufficiently and cheat in that way. But that wouldn't, I mean, then we no longer have a truly mobile application, right? Because you need this additional infrastructure. So it's always the question of what you want to show. Um, eventually, I believe, um, so, the, you know, the, the, the research on, uh, on SLAM was, multi, was built in multi-object tracking. And so semantic SLAM where things are segmented and then tracked individually on the fly. This is already ongoing, uh, but it's too early to actually use it for sort of uh, uh, mature augmented reality applications. And, uh, and, and then there's always in research, what you can always do is not again cheat and not run it on the mobile device but instead have some edge server and uh, stream the results to the device just in time um, i'm trying to avoid that but sometimes it even makes sense right so when you look at this basement scenario there has to be some server infrastructure as well because the sensors have to be connected to something otherwise it doesn't make any sense yeah? and uh, indeed i mean you do have uh, uh, building infrastructure, building computing infrastructure is a common thing now if you have a large office building. Um, so this isn't just something that we cook up in the lab and that is uh, not related to the real world. I have one more question. Uh, so uh, you started talking about the, the, let's say, the advantages of, of data visualization um, and especially abstract uh, visualization. And 
I was wondering, with all the examples of situated visualization we have, we usually take advantage of um, mostly 2D uh, uh, representations projected over the surface, glyphs, text, um, so not really exploring very different visual metaphors. And I was wondering if it's, uh, it's an opportunity to um, design or create, investigate new uh, uh, data representation modalities and, and visual metaphors, or if it's still related to the limitations of, of um, reality and interaction. And so I think this is a great idea to, but you have to be very careful to make sure you actually, the, the result is an improvement. Yeah? The, I, when I go to, so this is, now, now we're talking among uh, researchers in VR, AR, yeah? and I think may, most of most of the people in the audience will not be primarily visualization researchers. When I go to a visualization conference, there's always this this um, this expectation that 3D is bad if the data isn't already 3D. Yeah, this is, and it's true just adding a random dimension. You have some data which may be one dimensional or two dimensional like a table and suddenly you make it float in 3D space and you know, drilling around or whatever is not adding any value. It looks fancy, but it's actually detrimental to the, to the perceptual quality in many instances. But then um, you are right. And I'm, I'm really intrigued by the, the possibility of having additional degrees of freedom that could somehow be useful. And, and one example might, for example, be um, just using the physical structures as a, um, to, set the, to set the stage. Yeah? So if you want to show something that is related to my person, you might not have it floating over my head but instead you might have it you know aligned with the silhouette of my head yeah that's something you wouldn't do on a 2d screen yeah so but but this is first of all it's subtle and second it requires some design skill so you, i i i mean i don't see myself as a as a visual designer and i would leave that to the people who really do it well yeah we give them some tools to try things like that, but usually less is more. Okay, so thank you, Dieter, so much for uh, your talk. Um, thank you for having me. I thank you uh, a lot for accepting our invitation, for talking to us, and I wish you uh, all the attendees of SVR a great conference and uh, hope everybody's on our next session for um, our technical session on augmented reality uh, with our papers on this topic. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.